Okay, we're going to begin this afternoon session, and uh, soon we're going to uh, have a little block out here, but with Vivian Mann, who's the curator of Jewish Judaica. art, of Judaica, at the Jewish Museum in New York, and she will discuss speakers of the Burial Society of Worms. Prior to Kristallnacht, the synagogue at Worms, built in 1174-5, had been the oldest existing synagogue in Europe. Its plan, a double-naved structure with three bays, was the first built in what became a standard form for synagogues erected in the German lands during the High Middle Ages. The Alt-Neuschule at Prague and the Regensburg Synagogue depicted by Albrecht Altdorfer before its destruction on the order of the city council are two other examples. This plan was preferred by Jewish communities because it was not used for churches, but only for subsidiary buildings uh, like chapter houses and monasteries. I just show you what I'm talking about is that they vertical down the length of the men's synagogue, the space is divided by a column or part of a column here and a column here into three bays. There's another column outside the area of the screen. Two aisles, three bays. The Worm Synagogue was enlarged by the addition of a Frauenschule, um, which was erected in 1212-13, uh, which is rather early. That's this area. This is the Men's Synagogue. And in 1621, a Beit Midrash was added, named the Rashi Shul after the city's most famous Jewish scholar. Having witnessed the destruction of the most important buildings of the community, Michael Oppenheim of Mainz saved three of the Worms community's most important objects. It's two burial society beakers that you see on the screen, and it's pitcher by hiding them in a bank vault in Mainz until 1951, when he took them out and brought them to New York and gave them to the Jewish Museum. The earlier beaker, which you can see on the left, was made in Nuremberg, by, which was a major center for German silver making, by the artist Johann Conrad Weiss uh, in 1711-12, while the second is an unmarked copy, probably made around 1732, perhaps in Worms itself. The beakers are covered with names of members of the society, including some like the imperial court Jew, Samson Wertheimer, who was born in Worms but who no longer lived there at the time that the beaker was made. His principal residence at that time was in Eisenstadt outside of Vienna. We may interpret the inclusion of Wertheimer's name as pride, pride in the native son of the city, who did very well, but more likely its inclusion represents recognition of the donation of the beaker to the Worms Society by Wertheimer as court Jews often supported Jewish institutions in various communities. And this is now the beaker. I'm showing you the beaker as a whole on the right. And on the left is the um, plaque which was added to it saying that it was dedicated to the Hever Kedisha. It actually was probably something that was um, purchased that had been fabricated beforehand it was made between 1685 and 70. There are several interesting questions that may be asked about the Worms Burial Society beakers. One, what was a burial society? Two, what were the purpose of the beakers? What was their relationship to similar works made for non-Jews? And why is there a difference in the authorship of the two cups and in their appearance? I'd like to deal with the first. What was a burial society? The first question, of course, has a Jewish answer. Societies specifically dedicated to burial of the dead have been an integral part of the Jewish communal organizations, 
perhaps as early as the 4th century CE, depending on how one interprets the Talmudic text in Moed Kotan 27b. But in any case, by the 14th century, there were organizations devoted to burial of its members. In 1564, Rabbi Eliezer Ashkenazi of Prague reorganized the burial society to be responsible for the entire community. Then Judah Loeb Ben Betzalel codified the Prague society rules and regulations, which became the model for other Ashkenazi chavrot. There is a remarkable series of paintings in Prague that were commissioned during the 1780s um, to show the good works of the society in response to Emperor Joseph II's attempt to disband religious organizations. He wanted to create a modern state and saw religious societies as vestiges of an ancien regime. The paintings show the work of the Hever Kadisha and that it went far beyond the presentation of the corpse for burial and interment. And I, I'm just showing you a few. On the top, the, the uh, uh, man is sick in bed. The Hever has called the doctor. The family is there. They sit with him. He dies. As he dies, they wrap the body. The sh shrouds are prepared. And there are another six or seven paintings like this, but the most interesting one is the preparation of the body for burial. This one, because um, it actually has included in it some of the objects that have remained from this period. For example, these, let me get rid of this, excuse me, um, these placards which hold prayers that are recited during the Tara. Uh, and also you can see that this man at the head holds a comb for combing the hair of the deceased and the shrouds are here uh, on a little step stool. Uh, I would like now to talk about the Burial Society Beakers and I will make a confession that for some years while serving as curator of Judaic at the Jewish Museum, I didn't understand the exact purpose of Burial Society Beakers. They come in both enameled glass and silver, which are prestigious materials, and their ownership might have simply been a mark of honor, like the silver owned by a wealthy individual. Then I had the good fortune to find a responsum of Eliezer Deutsch, who lived between 1850 and 1917, rabbi of Tolna, Hungary, published in his volume Pre Hasadeh, number 73 in which he described the annual banquet of the Burial Society. This banquet is always held by Chevrot on the seventh of the month of Adar, which is both the birth and death date of Moses. Some Chevrot fast and visit the cemetery on that day before gathering for a communal meal. Deutsch wrote that in the time of the Chatam Sofer, Rabbi Moses Sofer, the leader of Hungarian Orthodoxy, there was the custom of setting up two tables for the Burial Society banquet. One, the dais for important rabbis and prominent members, and the second at which sat the apprentices. Those of the second group who were considered worthy of participating in the work of the Chever Kedisha were invited to drink from its silver beaker after dinner. Now, I'll just read you a little bit of a my translation of the original text. I received your letter, he writes to Rabbi Samuel Danto, a, a Torah scholar in Pressburg. I received your letter concerning the large banquet sponsored by the Burial Society. Those who assisted in this society are seated at one table. At another table are seated members of the Jewish court, the Bet Din, and other important members of the society. Only after the assistants have eaten and drunk at the first table were they called to the other table where they were expected to drink from the silver goblet provided by members of the society. A second blessing is recited on the wine. And the halakhic question that was involved, uh, that comes up after this description 
was whether the initiate who had drunk wine with his meal and said blessing over it should be required to say a second blessing when he drank from the society's silver cup as a mark of initiation. Rabbi Deutsch answered in the affirmative for several reasons, one of which was that the two blessings were separated in time, like the two sets of blessings over wine recited at weddings. For the historian who studies responsa, it is usually the descriptive portion of the question which is of most value, as it is in this case. Ephraim Deutsch's account is so vivid as to allow us to visualize the relationship of the tables and the initiates going up to the dais to drink from the society's beaker. We can understand the significance of the beaker in the functioning of the society. Excuse me, just one second. What's the volume of that beaker? Um, it's this big. That's a big beaker. It's a big beaker. Yes. Well, I don't say they drank the whole thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> All right. I'd like to now turn to my third question. Why did the burial society own an ex a beaker of such expensive materials? And did their ownership relate to the role of silver and enameled glass in the holdings of Christian societies? I'm going to first talk about enameled glass. This is one of the earliest extant burial society cups that stems from Bohemia, which is not surprising given the importance placed by the rabbis of Prague and other Bohemian cities on the role of the Hever Kadisha within their communities. It is a tall glass called a humpen from Polma, or Polin, Bohemia, and is dated 1691 by inscription. Members of the Hevra carry the beer, carrying the beer, march around the circumference of the glass. In other words, the members are shown doing their characteristic activity. The cup belongs to a glass of humpen produced in 17th century Bohemia which are members of a guild performing their typical work, like the glass, this glass of the Tailor's Guild in the Decorative Arts Museum in Prague. That the glasses of the burial societies parallel those of the guilds is not surprising, since it was the Christian guilds who assumed the social welfare responsibilities also undertaken by the burial societies. In Bohemia, religious differences forced the Jews of Bohemia to form chevrot. In terms of work, embroiderers belonged to the same guilds as Christian silversmiths, as Christians in the 17th century, although Jews had their own guilds as silversmiths. This was not true throughout Europe, but was true in Bohemia. The art form used, enameled glass, was a less expensive version of glass decoration for those who could not afford the etched uh, glass and crystal first created at Rudolf II's court in Prague early in the 17th century. This slide is a slightly later glass, uh, etched glass of around 1700. Enameled glass was a type of artwork commissioned by the lesser nobility in the guilds. Similar burial society glasses were produced in Bohemia throughout through the 19th century. I want to turn to silver now. Silver had been a preferred medium for drinking vessels since Roman times, but its use was largely restricted in the Middle Ages to the church and royalty. In the 15th century, the amount of silver mined in the German lands increased, enabling nobles, burghers, and guilds to possess silver vessels. The discovery of the Americas radically changed the amount of silver available and fueled its more widespread consumption. By 1690, the use of silver had spread throughout society as groups and individuals acquired beautiful yet utilitarian vessels that, if necessary, could be mel melted into bullion. That is, the widespread availability of silver coincides with the period when the burial societies were beginning to commission ceremonial beakers. In the 16th and 17th centuries, another concept accrued to silver. 
The power was shown and maintained through the display of wealth. Extravagant and expensive objets created a favorable impression of magnificence, of power, and of greatness. This concept led the aristocracy and the wealthy, the guilds and the chevrot, even the city governments to acquire silver, which were not necessarily used, only displayed in order to impress the visitor who might be the representative of another government or corporate body. Some cities, for example, had only one piece of display silver or a few, like this picture of the city of Goslar, fashioned in 1477, one of only two pieces owned by the city council. It is a masterpiece of the goldsmith's art. The turn base rises from an openwork band of oak leaves. The turn body of the picture emerges from a frieze that includes bust figures of musicians and the coats of arms of Gosler. A baldacchino in the form of a crown rises from the cover. It encloses the figure of St. George and the Dragon. The coat of arms of the city forms the apex of the composition. As I mentioned, silver vessels had a monetary value. They could easily be melted into bullion providing ready cash. The most lavish city silver collection of the 16th century was that owned by the relatively small city of Lüneburg. In 1610, the city owned 253 pieces of silver, but in 1672, desperate for funds, the city pawned four-fifths of its collection, retaining only 45 of, of its most artistic pieces. That is what you see in front of you. The collection was not used, but was displayed on festive tables and on a credenza where honored visitors were allowed to view it. Its purpose was to evoke wonder and to represent the prosperity of the city. The donors were members of patrician families and city council members. It became the custom for each mayor to donate an extraordinary work that was a monument to his devotion to Lunenburg. Only a few goldsmiths were allowed to create for the patricians and the council, which meant that the fabrication of the silver and its donation was strictly controlled, adding to the prestige of the gift. Even the royal houses owned large amounts of silver, which could be used for ready cash. This is just a part of the display at the Berlin Schloss in 1780. Oh, eight. In, this was in a room called the Richardson. Other corporate bodies within the city also owned works in silver, namely the guilds, whose possessions added to their prestige. This is a 1665 cup of the Tailors Guild of Hanover. It is within this artistic context that we must view the creation of beakers and pitchers for the burial societies. The Chevrot were comparable to Christian guilds in their quasi-religious character and in their similar activities in the realm of social welfare. The custom of holding the annual banquet of the Chevrot on the 7th of Adar, connected with Moses, parallels the practice of the guilds who had their banquets on a fixed day, the silversmiths' guild, the saint's day of Saint Eligius. At the same time, the burial societies were the preeminent organization within a Jewish community in the pre-modern period. Their officers were drawn from the wealthy of the community and membership was a coveted honor. As the guilds had done earlier, the societies began to commission silver vessels as silver became more available in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. The Burial Society of the Venerable Community of Worms possessed three pieces of fine silver. The Chevra of the Frankfurt Jewish community owned five. Uh, the location of these is not certain at this point, the, the five connected with the uh, Chevra Kedisha, but this is what they looked like. They had, a, this is an old photo, they had a, the name of the person written in a, in a circle, and within was his house sign, you know, 
Rothschild, you know, well, no, people were called by their house signs in Frankfurt. But there do, uh, there does remain this pair of beakers that belong not to a Hever Kadisha, but to an, a society for the circumcision of young boys. And uh, these two cups, this society probably uh, supported the circumcision and the festive meal afterwards uh, for people who could not afford it. And these two cups were used uh, at that time and have the same kind of composition as the Heber Kadisha one. This, this, um, okay. And just want to say that as the Frankfurt Beakers inscribed with the names of members in a circular frame became full, another beaker was commissioned to allow the recording of new members. This discussion of Burial Society silver suggests a rationale for the relative paucity of 17th century synagogue silver and its flowering in the 18th century. One could assume that the expulsions from the German cities in the 16th century led to a destruction of sil synagogue silver and the need to establish new communities and the movement eastward to Poland and Russia postponed the commissioning of ceremonial silver. But the lack of silver available to the general population until the last decades of the 17th century may be another reason for the paucity of silver Judaica earlier. With the 18th century came the commissioning of works like this Torah crown made by Joachim Hubner of Berlin in 1779, commissioned by the Burial Society of the Schottland Synagogue of Danzig. This crown exemplifies another role of Hevrot as patrons of the synagogue providing it with silver money, ornaments for the Torah and other Judaica. Their donations were pious gifts, but also a form of display expressing the wealth and eminence of the society. I now come to my last question. Why is there a difference in the authorship of the two Gorms cups? As I mentioned previously, the cup on the left was made by Johann Conrad Weiss, an esteemed silversmith from Nuremberg, a great center for the fabrication of silver. The other cup bears no marks. Although obviously based on Weiss's cup, it is less well proportioned and the moldings are not as fine. A similar case of copying for the Jewish community of Danzig may explain what happened in Worms. The Danzig collection, now in the Jewish Museum, New York, is the only Jewish communal collection to survive the Second World War intact. It is thus of inestimable value in allowing us to trace patterns of patronage, preferences for certain types of objects, and the taste of a community. Of the four synagogues in the community, the Schottland Synagogue preferred to purchase its important Judaica from silversmiths in Berlin. For example, the crown we have just seen, and this pair of Torah finials by August Gensmer, made between 1788 and 1802. Berlin was a much more important center of silver making than the more provincial Danzig. Twenty or thirty years later, the congregation decided to commission a matching pair of finials. Gensmer was dead by that time. And rather than return to an expensive silversmith in Berlin, they asked a local Danzig silversmith, Johann Gottlieb Ulrich, to copy the Berlin finials, which he did between 1821 to 1828. I apologize, I don't have a photo of them. Lacking the training and, and skill of Gensmer, Ulrich's work is a weaker and less harmonious version of the earlier finials. The difference between the Worms beakers may be due to a similar cause, a desire to save money and the availability of a local artisan. The fact that the second silversmith of the beakers did not hallmark his work suggest that he was not yet a master, but still an apprentice, or that he could not be a master, perhaps because he was a Jew. 
There are records of Jewish silversmiths in medieval Germany, and in 17th century Danzig, a Christian silversmith was fined for having Jewish apprentices. Thus, unofficially, Jews were functioning as silversmiths outside the guild system of the German lands, but were usually unable to avail themselves of the superior training the guilds offered, and of course, they could not use the guild stamp of approval or hallmark. The warm speakers and pictures are objet d'art and not documents in the usual sense. There is one way, however, that they serve as normative documents through their inscriptions. Knowing when the Weiss speaker was made from its hallmarks, the list of members engraved on the cup is a demographic record for those years with the caveat that some famous sons of the Jewish community of Worms lived elsewhere most of the time, although maining, uh, maintaining their membership in the Hever Kaddisha. Similarly, by matching the names on the unmarked beaker with other records, one is able to date the cup and retrieve a list of the Jewish residents of Worms for the year of its fabrication. As I have tried to show, the cups and and the picture can also be interpreted in the light of the economic and social history of the time and through the insights of rabbinic literature, yielding an understanding of the activities of the Jewish community of Worms and of other communities that is not available in texts per se. Thank you. Um, I, I'm interested uh, in the uh, in the issue you raised in terms of uh, the Chavarot as uh, uh, displaying wealth, as the use of the silver as a form of uh, display and, and things like that, and it raises a series, and you talked about them as uh, patrons in the synagogue and things like that, and so forth. Well, it, it raises a series of interrelated uh, uh, consumption questions about luxury and luxury laws and luxury restrictions. So, for example, uh, do you see, do you have any evidence of um, uh, restrictions on display that, I mean, is it possible that display through the Chavra becomes a way of avoiding uh, other consumption restrictions? So, for example, you had a, a society that gave money to support circumcision feasts, so you were positive. Well, in I know of communities where the, virtually the first law they pass is how many people you can invite to a circumcision feast, how many people can come to a wedding, things like that. So, you know, I, I wonder to what extent these societies are either a way of coping with unrestrained competition among the members or among the community, or they're a way of avoiding uh, the restrictions on competition, because by giving the money to the to the Chavra, and then the Chavra could in effect provide things for its members, it was a way of engaging in display or shared display or something that otherwise was restricted. I have not investigated records. In fact, I, I was sitting there with the Danzig records, you know, sort of toting up how many pieces were given by the Hever Kadisha out of how many shields, you know. And it, it didn't come to more than 25% of, of any particular type. And I have not uh, investigated all well, the sumptuary uh, laws, but the, I, I do know that Hever, and particularly the Hever Kadisha, that they were a very well-endowed philanthropy. And they were the most important members of the community. It was considered the greatest honor to be part of that Kevra, and they had money. So whether there were, and, and out of that money, one of the things they did was to buy this place over. And if we ask, you know, if, if, if you think about what would be acceptable, you know, you could take a paper cup if such existed and, and induct people into a society, but they didn't do that. I mean, what we know that uh, you you had to be wealthy to join the Chavot Kaddisha, otherwise, because this means you stop working for money. I mean, you you must didn't be have to work enough. all the time. That's yes. what take off. Why? Oh, that you could take off at any time yeah. to go yeah. join. But, but they had paid employees. 
I mean, I, I, I don't think they actually showed up all the time. I know, according to these paintings, they were in all the dark. Okay. Mm -hmm. As I understand Kevra Kadisha, which, by the way, is very nice is what you were saying, it turned out to be a um, sub power within the community. As the community, the community board itself became less and less powerful due to the state intervention, being a member of the Kevra Kadisha gave you enormous status within the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Which, being a member of the community board, being a Polonas or whatever, became became less prestigious. Mm -hmm. Which is why the idea that it would have to have kind of conspicuous consumption, more silver, and donate silver to the community, would be clearly a way of expressing this kind of power, informal power, within the community. But you think that's restricted to Prague? Or you think that's no, I think, no, no, I think, no, I think, the, I think the, that's the, the European wide phenomenon that starts in this period. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that um, there are much fewer the women the women are shown on a couple of the, the enamel glass speakers, but together with the men, you know, separately, but along with the men, I should say. Uh, so the, there's an acknowledgement that there were women's chevrot, and and there's a, occasionally you find a piece that was donated by a woman's chevrot, but of course they don't have the magnificence of these donations. Please answer the question to us: Do we have similar things from chevrot balei malacha from craftsmen's guilds, or only from chevrot mitzvah? Like you mean in Prague or in general? In general, in Europe. In general. Well, yeah, Jews were not allowed to. No, no, Bali. No, no, the chevrot you deal. I mean donations of the chevrot to the synagogue. Uh, no, no, I mean, no. do we have similar beacons? from Jewish chevrot, which were not chevrot mitzvah, but were chevrot malacha, chevrot um, of craft. Mm, there weren't so many chevrot of craft. There were in Eastern Europe. There were, there were, there were chevrot, but I think you have to go back to what, I think you have to go back to the function of the beaker. And if the tshuva is indeed correct, and that's the, the function of it, then has to do with some sort of sudat mitzvah. Yeah. But the chevrot balei, they, they all had sudat. They had mostly, to, yeah. mostly on the same date as well. So I understand. Zainas, right? yeah. um, I have seen, um, there are a lot of donations of, of um, as I say, this don, you know what, one second. The Danza collection is, is, is a, a gold mine because it's, it's unique, it's complete. And within it, there are donations from other chevrot. There was a, and and uh, there was a chevra for um, the lighting the the oil of the nertomid. And there's the pinkas of that chevra, and it shows a, a yearly banquet. Uh, then there was a chevra for the maintenance of books. There was a, a woman's chevra. There was a young man's chevra. I mean. The, there are about ten of them within this small Jewish community. So, they did give silver, or a lot of them were collection plates for donations. So, another purpose that you see Chevrolet giving objects for in Prague the processions. So, Chevrolet Mitzvah that Vivian just mentioned give textiles also to the Prague synagogues. Women, men called up to the Torah, all these are what you're defining as Chevrolet Mitzvah that give. Beautiful textiles. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> the silver, there's a, a big uh, piece maybe you know it better. The, the tall butchers. clowns. I mean, the big butchers. Uh, no, that's pewter. That's pewter. Okay. Okay. That was no, carried in the procession honoring the birth of Joseph II. So maybe they have different functions, as you said. But no, but there are uh, the same that other, they're doing. Other ceremonial. Yeah. That's a, a, yeah, a that's case right. where the the Jewish butchers, along with all the other Jewish community, marched in the city in front of everybody. All the residents of the town come out, and they have these different kinds of objects. The ritual objects and textiles also come out. So it's good. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of these customs are, have their origins in Christian confraternities, yeah. and date back mm -hmm. much further. Yes. Ellie Harwood, of course, wrote a dissertation on that. But um, the one I know very well in Amsterdam, the Dotara, the function of which was, it was both a mutual aid society and a charitable organization, but I would say their object was an urn that was used for the lottery to choose the winners, and this was a minhag that came from Italy, where lotteries were frequently used. You also have it, I have to tell you, it, there's one in Prague for the Chavar to elect members to the Chavar Kadisha. This is where black, the term... It's shown in one of the paintings. The one of the term, with the term black ball somebody, 
Yeah. Yeah. Where you put two balls in. Yeah. You're, you're given two balls, a white ball and a black ball. And when the person's name is called, you either put in the white ball or the black ball. And if you reject them, you blackball them. Okay, so but they still do this in the Spanish Portuguese synagogue in New York to elect members. <laughs> yeah, really? Yes. So I, I don't think that that's not a it's restricted a phenomenon. They have a, a silver urn? I didn't say they had a. I, I'm not been present at their <laughs> meetings, but I've been told this is what goes on. Do we know um, anything about the medieval period? Uh, I'm just wondering whether there is the beakers or the objects are early modern because we have them or is it because there is a certain pattern of investment consumption that can be that clearly is different from the well that's that's what I talked about in the beginning in in the middle ages most silver was made for the church and the royalty and royalty and it wasn't until the beginning of the early modern period that the, the pro production from the mines was stepped up and that meant a broadening of the audience who could now afford silver and, the, and then the, the coming of silver from the Americas caused a tremendous change and that silver became widespread it's estimated around 1690 just at that point where more Hevrot order silver. I, I must tell you that there is a, a beaker, uh, a, a chalice-like cup that belonged to the Hevra Kedisha in Worms in 16, belongs to it in 1609. Um, but that's the only really early one I'm, I know. But the making of these lavish and bigger ones, um, it only starts when silver becomes more available. So prior to that, they might have pewter, or they wouldn't have those ceremonies, these dinners, these... You mean the Hevra Kadisha? They it have a Kadisha. It was founded in the 16th century. 1564. Yeah, so that one that you're talking about? No, were the park, park. Oh, okay. So that's an early one. No, no, no. They were, they were Hevrot that were private Hevrot. In other words, you, your family might have a Hevra that was responsible to bury people, or your your trade. But it was only in 1564 that Rabbi Eliezer Ashkenazi yeah. formed this Hevra and said this is responsible for the community as a whole. So that, that was a real ch sea change. The Chavarot in Italy are a little bit earlier. That's right. They did. A little bit. One of the claims is that he invested on the his experience in, uh, the, in the Orient, right. in the Sephardi right. That's why he's as a Because uh, we know of brought from medieval Spain. I mean. Right, that's the other question. In other words, no, but those were only for the members of the Hevra, not for the community. Yeah, yeah. That, that, it seems to me, is, 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 is the problem here, which isn't directly related to the material aspects of what you're talking about, but the sort of link of this to the existence of Chavarot and the question that Magda's raising. Elliot, in, in his studies, and other people who worked on it, the real question is, when they first started, were they simply imitations of Christian models? And, uh, uh, or were they something that was uh, endemic, uh, internal? But the other question is, what was their real function? Were they there for reasons of isolating a group within the community, that is, an elite within the community? Or and that's that's sort of what you're suggesting happened later. Later, but it it's it, it, it uh, there's another theory that says that the chavra is there as a pro proto communal institution. In other words, before there was stu structured kilot in Italy, what you have is the creation of chavarot, which are kind of beginnings, and then these later become communities. Wait, um, so what is that? Yeah, but well, uh, it, well, it's a 16th century 16th phenomenon. Century. The key law is invented in Italy. I mean, it depends who you listen to, but uh, but Bonfield has argued, I think, persuasively that the chavra, that the key law in Italy, in the institutionalized sense that we mean it, mm -hmm. is a mid-16th century right. phenomenon. He's talking specifically about the position of the rabbinate, but I think it applies also to Takanot. But there are Takanot well, in Spain in the 15th century. Shlomo ben Ibn Adret talks about chavro too, but, but they were not for right. the whole community. It's, it's, they were in, you know, right. groups. Right, those seem to be groups, groups of people of, who So they're, they're, they're your proto-examples. The they're your proto-examples. Like uh, yeah, maybe. 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 Okay, so that that's a different... And also, the situation, I think, in Spain was very different because 
people were living throughout Spain in these very small communities. Uh, small, uh, you know, one, two hundred people, mm -hmm. maybe not a hundred people, you know, and they and there would, would be more of a tendency to take care of each other. You know? mm -hmm. As far as the distinction between the private Hebra and the one that performs a full communal function, I didn't think you would be arguing that the assumption of silver was related to, or, or, or did I misunderstand? In other words, I mean, because for an imitation of, of, of a guild practice, of a Christian model, that Christian model might apply to something like guild, which was really for the, the, the silver uh, for the tailors and, and so on, and, uh, irregardless of whatever, uh, what they might carry in procession. So, I mean, their, their banquet on their saint's day, uh, they would use uh, these kinds of materials in a particular way as part of an initiation process and so on. So, so my question is, do we know anything about the material culture of these kind of wrote in the earlier stage, in the proto, what you're calling the proto stage? Did they use pewter? I, I want we to don't. To we yeah, don't. Yeah. And we don't have, I mean, the, 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 the Worms Cup, which I think still exists, I think I saw it, I mean, it, I think it survived Kristallnacht, is 1609. The 1691 enamel glass one is, is the earliest of that type. So we don't have them from before. And now, now either, either, you know, we could argue upheavals or destruction, or we could say, you know, that the community wasn't wealthy enough to, to consider silver Commissions. I mean, the questions, and if we can't talk about the um, the Hebrot, then uh, what about the uh, ornaments within the synagogue, the Rimonim, this kind yeah. of? Th so, do we have any any evidence from the medieval period? What it was? Oh, sure, we do. Well, so well, again, well, what kind of material was used? What kind of what was used? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it depended. We don't have material from all over. We 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 know about Spain. We have one pair of finials from Spain. We have uh, one pair of uh, silvered copper, the earliest Sephardi finial, 1601, found in Budapest. You know, because of the Hungarian invasion. Uh, we don't. We don't have. We have lists. From the Geniza, in fact, as early as the 12th century, we have lists of gilt and gilt silvered ornaments and silver tikim and so forth. So, and that's a big change. There's a 1058 inventory which talks about copper mostly, and then by the 12th century, they're having silver and, and plated silver. So, we really only know. Something and we can see also in some synagogue scenes in the uh, Hagadot from Spain that they had a rimanim and they had crowns together. Could I ask a question of both Vivian and Shalom Sabar? And that has to do with the, the whole process of commissioning these things and having either Jewish symbols or uh, inscriptions when the artisans making them are not Jewish, and I assume that in many cases they're not. Do we know anything about that? Well, I, obviously, they, the inscriptions had to be made by Sofrim, by, by scribes. Well, well, not necessarily. I mean, you could have uh, typesetters who are Christians who are not. So they may have, ages, they the may have uh, copied things, right? Yeah. So this. Yes. Yes. These objects are actually the made. good objects I have do. good inscriptions. It's, it's very, like the most beautiful cedar plate, or maybe the only only one from medieval Spain, if it is from medieval Spain, in the Israel Museum is filled with mistakes. Yes, but so every, the claim is that the Muslim did it, maybe. But all Majolica plates, whether they were made for Christians or Muslims or Jews from that period, are filled with mistakes. Maybe it was just well, I'm not sure. Or maybe no. it was a... Another theory, it's a Marano Jew, who didn't know Hebrew well, and so on. The only, only, only word that's spelled uh, right there is Maror. And they say it's not by accident, it's <laughs> Maror, he knew how to no, spell but, 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 sure. In the Datsy collection, there's a parochet that has a mistake in the name of the donor, as I recall. 
That happens in universities too. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the exhibit. Was, was the exhibit, uh, the the Danzig stuff, was exhibited at the Semitic Museum. Yes. When I was still there, and uh, I remember that one of the the thing that was right outside my office, in fact, had a mistake. It was a parochet. It was one of the early parochets from the community, and it had a mistake, if I remember correctly, in the name of the donor. Yes, yes. Good. They spelled it. They spelled it. They spelled it. They spelled it. No, they spelled it. Something about objects and silverweight objects. We have lists of objects taken from synagogues in Sicily at the time of the expulsion, which means the 15th century. And uh, what is well known are the silver monuments that are going to the Torah. Mm -hmm. uh, I can add to that the discovery that I made personally by chance a description of the Etz Chaim mm. of silver. Of silver, it says specifically. Uh, it's also that the, the, the way it is described mm -hmm. as two, uh, oh, in English, uh, <laughs> the, uh, spindles, two spindles. Really? Spin two spindles made of silver for holding the Torah. Mm -hmm. I can say for holding the Torah? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you're not talking, you're, you could be talking about the handles. Yeah, yeah that's a chain. But still, they are made of silver, it's unusual. It would be very soft, it would be hard to work. In, in the peace. World, the world is no, but, but we also have lists. Um, Motus Dolade has published a list of what was confiscated from the Jews when they left Spain. And they confiscated everything, even textiles, because the textiles were embroidered in silver and uh, metallic thread and they were burned to get the bullion. So, um, in this case, there was somebody who stole this stuff. Mm. <laughs> we, we talked a little bit about uh, the beakers themselves. Can we talk a little bit about what goes in the beakers, in terms of material culture and what people eat? Wine. Wine? Beer? Yeah, beer. No, it was wine. It, it, it specifically That's a said, lot of wine to consume. Well, uh, it, 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 there's no mitzvah of rub costs. He didn't have to drink the whole no, thing. Didn't. But, but there could have been inducting. Many oh no! But why? why yeah. but that's some you of the. Had a sip. There'd be a lot of people taking a small sip, not yeah. each person drinking a full. The beer. whole the point's issue. well taken. But why do I take this further? It was essentially you having different rituals that have been created by these chevrot. Right. right? There is no ritual for inducting someone into a chevrot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's no ritual. If you can't look in Shulchan Aruch and find something about how do you induct someone into a chevrot, these chevrot had to make their own rituals. Oh, excuse me, there's no fixed ritual. That's right, there's no the traditional okay. Jewish ritual that goes back to the Talmud or something yeah. like that. How does one enter a chevra? So essentially, these chevrot have been had to make their own induction ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Now, if these, if the use of wine is what's used, so essentially, my guess would be, I'm certainly not a historian of how religious uh, things begin, but essentially, wine has a certain central place within Jewish culture, and, mm -hmm. and so they've borrowed that and brought that over. If it's just plain drinking, if you go to Corning, New York, and you see these big beakers of things in the beer, you know, they could be drinking beer. No. If anyone watched this on the video, they're going to say, how much water do these people drink? <laughs> My goodness, it must be what they serve for lunch. Uh, the, 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 the whole issue was, the, 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 issue, the reason that the description came was because of the issue that, that when they drank it, they drank wine with the meal, yeah. did they have to make a second bracha? when they were inducted into the Hebron so, so, afterwards. So then so therefore I, you have a bracha with the induction. No, so, so uh, yeah. in the tshuva he says they could be told to set, to remember in their heads that when they made the first bracha that make it snai, that this did not apply to the second bracha because they wanted them to make a new bracha. Well, and, and one of the reasons he gives for making a new bracha is that there's a separation in time between the yeah, first drinking and the second drinking. Sechat, that, whatever you da, 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 da. want. But there's still a ritual. Yes, they they've, they've created, they've created a ritual. Created rituals. Rituals. Is yes. the size perhaps related to the number of members? And and how many times you would have to refill? I think it has to do. And if, I, I, if there is a smaller yes. community, the bikers might be smaller. And I, I think it has to do with the impressiveness of the side, the, 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 you know, we're talking about something this big, mm -hmm. and and the impressiveness of that size, mm -hmm. you know, that it's something that you look at and you realize this is, you know, this is a substantial chevra. <laughs> you know, they own, 
I don't know if I have the size with me. Did they own? I, I did bring, in case anybody was interested, I, I brought all the lists of names. The height is nine and three quarter inches of the cups, and the diameter of the lip is four and three sixteenths. Okay. It's about. And people, um, you know, don't really. I, I, I think inscriptions are a tremendous source of history. Uh, inscriptions on ceremonial objects that has not yet been mined sufficiently. But one of the paintings uh, in the series shows them drinking. No, the la one of the last paintings. It it was done later. It was done later. Yeah, but it's still from the 18th century. Oh, I, I oh that slide I, have. Yeah, I may have yeah, a slide because yeah. it shows them drinking from these cups. And yeah, the it shows. After the initial series of paintings were made, three were added. Yeah. 